Um, so we're going to go through and talk about fault tolerant quantum computing um, and then talk, go back to the phase estimation algorithm. So talk in a bit more detail about the quantum Fourier transform that we mentioned before. Uh, and then just do a review of quantum phase estimation. And then we want to look at um, what the costs are associated with quantum computation. So how it scales, how the various aspects of particularly the quantum phase estimation scale. So what sort of time scales we might be looking at when we get to the stage that we can actually perform fault tolerant quantum computing. So basically the problem is we've got two options either we can make errors so low that we can run all the gates almost perfectly and at the end of the uh, circuit we've got basically no errors no matter how many times we run which is very impractical uh, or the other alternative is we keep correcting the errors um, because they're scaling exponentially there's nothing else we can do either we get rid of them completely or we just keep correcting them so the fault tolerant quantum computing is the idea that we keep correcting our errors. So the errors start to build up and then we get rid of them. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so the NISC architectures is what we've discussed before. So that's where we say, okay, we'll limit the size that we work with because there are errors and see if we can do something useful. Stabilizer codes are the type of codes I'm gonna talk about, which are the way that we detect and correct errors. And then we'll talk about uh, thresholds and some of the requirements for these codes, like something called transversality um, and what we mean by fault tolerance. And our focus will be on something called the surface code, which I'll introduce in a bit. So uh, this is a view of what we're trying to achieve. So if we think of the NISC devices as this H noisy region, so these are all the calculations that we can do if we have a noisy quantum computer. Then we've got H poly. So that's the idea that's saying if we have a limit of polynomial complexity, that's what we could do if we had full error correction. So if we had a perfect quantum computer, we could do H poly. And then the idea is that beyond that, there's other things that are also going to scale exponentially, even with a quantum computer. Um, and it's still unknown exactly where C poly is. So that's everything we could do efficiently on a classical computer. It's unknown whether this H noisy and this C poly, where exactly they lie with respect to each other. But the hope is that even with NISC devices, we can do some things that we couldn't do classically. Um, but we've got two problems with NISC devices. The first is their limit in computational power. We have to limit the size of the circuits because if we make them too big, the exponential noise scaling just kills everything. Um, which means there's a limit to how complex we can make our wave functions. So, for example, with the variational quantum eigensolver, there's a limit to how complicated our variational states can be, and therefore their expressivity. Um, there's also a problem with training. So as we increase the size of our circuits, we have to sample them more in order to get data out. So this plot here on the, on the right, is uh, well the plot over here on uh, your right is showing how many times you have to sample uh, the algorithm so these are different optimization algorithms and along the bottom we've got the number of qubits so as we increase the number of qubits we've got an exponential scale on the left so the number of shots we have to take is growing exponentially so we really need a lot of shots as we get bigger and that's a that's also another problem with these NISC uh, algorithms with variational algorithms um, so now we'll talk about error correction so the first thing we want to talk about is what we could do in a classical case so classical error correction one example is uh, a parity code so here what we do is very simple we just make some copies of our bits. So we could think of this as just saying if we want to store some data um, that's a zero, the classical zero, we could just make three copies of it. And then if there's some noise, maybe the noise will flip one of them. Uh, let's get 
So maybe our noise flips one of these, and so it's destroyed our data a bit. But we can do a parity test. So we can compare the two data bits in pairs. So we compare the first two and say, OK, that's different. And then we compare the second two, and we say that's the same. And that tells us there must be an error in the first bit. So we take a majority rule and just replace that with all zeros. And we can use this three repetition code. It can detect errors up to two errors. So if we get up to two errors, we can detect them. We flip two bits. But we can only correct up to one error. Because if we imagine we could either have a zero or a one, and a single error on a one could give us this, which is the same as one case of two errors on the two. So we have two terms. We have the error distance, or the code distance. And the code distance is how many errors we can get uh, before we flip from one state to the other. So if we start off in the all zero state, then if we get three errors, we'll flip to the all one state. So this is a code distance of three, but we can only actually correct a single error. Because as soon as we get two errors, applying the correction will actually make things worse. Now, this is great for classical computers, but the problem is it involves measuring our bits. So we have to know what the bit is. We measure all three, and then we do a majority rule. And we can't do that with qubits because we're not allowed to measure them. Um, we also know from the earlier talk that we can't even copy them. So the no cloning theorem means it's impossible to c copy qubits with a unit tree. Well, it doesn't quite mean that. It means it's impossible to copy an arbitrary state. But if we have orthogonal states, we can copy them. So I can do something uh, like this. So I can map 0, 0 to 0, 0, and also 0, 1 to 1, 1. So I could make a copy of certain states. But the problem is, if I want to copy a state uh, like this, so if it's a superposition that I want to copy, then if I apply my copying operator, I don't get two copies of psi. I just get some entangled state. And our question is, can we use something like this? So can we use the copying that we can do in order to put some resilience into our data? And that's what we're going to try and do with, our, with the first code I'll talk about. So this is a very simple code. It's next to useless for practical purposes, but it's nice for an illustration. So what we say is we say we are going to say our logical qubit is made up of multiple uh, physical qubits. So we've got three qubits, and we use those three qubits to make a single qubit in terms of our circuit diagram. Well, in terms of our calculation. And if there's any questions or anything at any point, um, just shout out or put your hand up, and we can go over it. But the idea is that this is sort of the closest analog we can get to the parity count. So what we do, uh, we prepare this circuit using a CNOT gate. So that means that we put in our original circuit, and then we copy it in the way that we can over to the other two qubits. So if we have a zero on the first qubit, the C0 does nothing. So if we start with zero input states, and if we have a one on the first qubit, then the other two are flipped, because the first one's flipped here and the second one there. So we end up with this that's now a superposition of the logical state. But because we're changing how we define things, we're now in a logical space, so we need logical operators. So we need a new type of uh, flip operator, the X. So rather than uh, flipping them individually with these separate Xs, we have to flip them all at once. So if we want to go from our original state psi to, um, to the state with X applied to it, so for example, if we could apply X0, XL, to 0L, we want to get 1L, which means we've got to flip every one of the spins all at once. 
for the Z operator for this code, it's a bit strange. So we've got some choices. Because the Z operator just applies a phase to the one logical state, we've got the choice of either applying uh, the Z operator to one of the qubits, or we could apply it to all of them. And they'll both give exactly the same result, which is also uh, linked to one of the problems with this code. Um, then this is to initialize the code. And the next question is, how can we use it to check for errors? And this is where things get a little bit more complicated. So what we're doing is we're imagining that our three qubits are encoding a logical state. So we've got the logical state here, and we've got three qubits. Now, what we want to do is we want to find out if there's an error. So we'll imagine that we get different types of errors and see if we can detect them. In order to run the code, we need to have not only our qubits, but we also have to have additional qubits, auxiliary qubits. And the reason for this is we can't ever measure our qubits to check, uh, to do the parity checks that we would do in the classical code. So instead, we've got to project the measurements onto another qubit uh, in such a way that we only we can only ever find out if we've got an error or not. We can't find out what the state we had originally was. Because if we find out the state, we performed a measurement on our original state and collapsed it. And then we lose all the information. So let's imagine we'll consider this first auxiliary qubit. We're going in here with this state, alpha 0, 0, and beta 1, 1. So it's an arbitrary single qubit state. If we imagine that we get an error on the first qubit, so we've just got an x error there, which means that we're flipping our state to the original state, but with the first qubit flipped. So this is the single error case in the classical example, but for the quantum version. Now the question is, what happens here? So we've got an x appearing at the top, which means when we're going through this, uh, OK, well, yes, let's do this case first. So we've got an x, x event happening. And then we go through this first c naught. The first c naught will change our auxiliary qubit to, we have the auxiliary qubit associated with this one and with this one. Let's put it up here. This is our first auxiliary qubit. And that's the first line here. So that's us over here. So we start off with zero. And then we apply the C naught between the first qubit and our auxiliary qubit. So this one flips the one. And this one, nothing happens. Uh, and then, no, sorry, that's yes. And then we have the second, the second gate. So this one looks at our second qubit. And if our second qubit is one, it flips it. So we get no flip here. Um, and here, if our second qubit is one, it flips it. So we get a flip here. So now we've got no matter what the no matter which one we tested, we get exactly the same result, which means we can factor it out. So we can write this as x1 psi factored with 1. Because no matter which part of this we consider the operation on, we get exactly the same state. Which means measuring this qubit, making this measurement here, will not have any effect at all on our original state, because they're in a product. So we can measure it without any problems. So now we measure it, and we get a 1 for that register. We then have the second auxiliary qubit, so that's the one here. We run the same thing again. This time, we do a C0 on the second qubit. So we do a C0 on the second qubit, and nothing happens here. Um, but here, there's a 1, so we flip the second qubit. So 0 here flips the 1. Uh, and this time we also do a C naught on the third qubit. So on the third third qubit, this one's zero, so it stays a zero. And this one, the th third qubit, is one, 
so it goes back to zero. So this time we get a zero. And again, it's in a product state. So we're saying the second parity check had no, didn't detect an error, but the first one did. And we can use this information to tell us where the the error is. So if there's if it's only detected on the first measurement, it means there's a problem between the first two. And it's not detected on the second, so this one's fine, which means the error must be on the first. So then we do a controlled gate, which means that we don't apply these other two x's that we could, we just apply the x on the first qubit. And because x1 squared is the identity, that's if we flip 0 to 1 and back to 0 again, or 1 to 0 and back to 1 again, then we get the state that we started with. So we've had one error. We've run the check. We've got some syndromes, what we call these, which is the 1, 0 syndrome, saying that we got 1 in the first register and 0 on the second. And then we use that information to correct it. So we've managed to correct our error without finding out which state we're in. OK, right. Now, as a test, we'll go back and just think about what, what will happen if there's no error. So we'll run through this quickly. We say the first gate, um, we check it's a zero on the first and a one on the second. So we flip if we're on the second. This gate, it's a zero on the first. So we've had two zeros, but this one's left a zero. Uh, and if we're on the second, we've had two ones. So we flipped it twice. So either way, we're at zero. OK, so that works. Now, what about the next one? The next one, we're checking the next two qubits, so the latter two. We say we get a zero, so we don't flip that one, and a zero, don't flip that one. So that's a zero. For the second one, we get a one and a one. So it is doing our parity check that we want, and nothing happens. We get two zeros, so we say don't apply any gates. Now, I'm afraid I haven't got any quizzes to do online, but what we can do is we can do a low-tech version. So I think I've got one here. Right. So this is a low-tech quiz. What I'm going to say, and I've got to work this out so that I can actually see what you're showing. So let's say this top register is going to be your right hand. OK. So do either 1 or 0. And then the bottom register, that can be your left hand. So again, do 1 or 0. And I want to see if we can work out what the syndromes are going to be if we have this x. So I've written out the state there. And I'll go through slowly. But as soon as you get the answer, if you put up your hands, and then we'll see if we can get everyone with answers before I get through the calculation. OK, so we've got, OK, we've got some. So the first thing we do is we write out the state. Um, so we've got alpha, 0, 1, 0, and then our two registers. And then we've got beta, 1, 0, 1, and two registers. And how are we doing now? How many people have got it? We still, OK, a few more. Right, the first gate that we do, this does nothing. And this one is flipped. OK. The second gate that we do is for the first one, we get a 1. And for the second one, we keep a 1, because we've already got it. OK, can I have a raise? How, what have we got now for the two register? OK, there's still a few around here. Um, OK, now the next gate, we're going to, the next gate we do is the other one on the middle qubit, but acting on the final one. So here, nothing happens. No. Yes. So we're, we're doing the middle qubit and acting on this one, if I get this right. Right. So that one should flip. And then we're also doing the same one here, so that one stays the same. And then final chance for the answer before we get it. OK, same again. Right. OK, so then this one does nothing. So when we're acting on these two, that's a zero. So the C naught does nothing. Oh, let's write out the C naught again, just in case, because maybe that was the problem. 
So the C naught is if we're on zero, we do nothing. And if we're on one, we do an X to do a flip. So the C naught, if it's acting on one, two, let's make that a clearer one. one. Let's try again. <laughs> right. One. And the tensor product is x. So that's one on the first and x on the second. And x is just a flip. So our last gate that we were doing flips it to one one. So everyone who said one one, perfect. And we'll check that I wrote it right on this. Yes. So here we have one one of the syndromes, and because it's one one, we know that it's the middle one that's flipped. So we flip it back. Um, now, as a quick question, I won't go through the calculation this time, but if we just have an X on if we have an X on the final line, can we have a quick show of hands for what the syndrome will be? So we've just got an X here and not on the top one. So we've got so I'll remind you the register. So this one should be your right hand and that should be your left. Zero one zero one zero one perfect. So I think yeah, we get zero one because it's doing a parity check on the two, and the first parity is fine. We get the same, but the second two parity is not what it should be. Okay, so this is our code. So we can correct one error, but what happens if we have two errors? So if we have two errors, then our parity check code thinks that we've got the syndrome zero one. So the same as the last one we've got. So it says, okay, we've got zero one, I'll correct zero one. It corrects zero one, and what it applies is the logical X. So it moves you to the other logical state. It flips the remaining qubit that was actually right, makes it wrong. So although we have a co an error uh, code distance of three, actually we can only correct errors up to one. Um, we can detect that there's an error here, but if we try and correct it, we make things worse. The other problem with this code is that it only does flip errors. So if we have a Z error, we have a phase error, what it does, ah, this is, so that state up the top is wrong. It should be uh, zero, 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 minus one, one, one. So it should be the same state as comes out at the end. So if we have a Z error, there's no way to detect it because we're not detecting phase. So we get a Z error and it's just left uncorrected and we'll propagate through our code. So this code is can correct one uh, flip, but that's all it can do. Um, and to go beyond that, we need to use a more complicated formalism that's called the uh, stabilizer formalism. So this is a different way of thinking about these sorts of code. And what we say is that um, we take all the Pauli operators, and the Pauli operators are a basis for us for the state. We take Pauli operators for every qubit. We can make these things called Pauli words that we saw earlier. So there's four, uh, well, if we count the plus and minus i uh, and the plus and minus uh, ones, then we can get, uh, what's that, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, six to the power of n different uh, Pauli words like this. But for now, we'll just ignore uh, the identity ones and just think about the x, y, and z words because we can always form an identity out of um, two x's, for example. So a stabilizer, we're defining a stabilizer um, as something that when you're given a particular state, it returns that state. So what we do is we pick a stabilizer, which will be one of these Pali words, and then we say, which states does it stabilize? So we look at all the possible states we could have, and we say, what, which of those states, out of all the possible states, are eigenstates with an eigenvalue of one of this stabilizer? So an example for our code before, um, we had zero, 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 
and this would be an eigenstate of Z operators. So this is an eigenstate of Z1, Z1, Z2, um, Z3. All of these will just give us back exactly the same state. Um, now, now we say, okay, let's say we choose a set of stabilizers. So we're going to get a large number of stabilizers. And we're going to say, I want to find which sides are stabilized by all of these stabilizers. And we also want the stabilizers to commute. So it doesn't matter which order we apply the stabilizers in. Um, we'll still get the same state back. Um, and we're not going to allow these plus or minus i states. So we'll ignore them. We'll take them out of our stabilizer. They will mess things up. Now, we now define a new set C that's our code space. So before our code space was this repetition code, so 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Now we think of a more generalized code space where it's just every state that if we act one of our stabilizers on, we get the state back again. So it's stabilized by our set of stabilizers. Now, if we, if we do this, we'll find the dimensions of our state space, C, is 2 to the power of the number of qubits minus the number of generators of our, um, of our stabilizer set. Now, I'll talk about what this, why we have to consider generators rather than every element on the next slide, I think. OK, so I'll give an example. Yes. So, yeah, so it's, we call it a stabilizer because the state is stable under the action of this. And then, in a sense, any state that's not in the set C won't be stable. Uh, it, will, it will have an eigenvalue of minus 1. But this is something I should have said. So the Pauli words all have eigenvalues of plus and minus 1 if we get rid of identities. So they'll have half the states will have an eigenvalue of 1 and half of minus 1. So what we're saying is that if you're not in this space, that means that you'll have an eigenvalue of minus 1 for at least one of our stabilizers. So you, you'll you change. So you, these states are stable under the stabilizers. And any other state is unstable in that we'll get a new state, up, even if it's only a phase, if we have the stabilizers. And we'll sh hopefully show why this is useful in a bit. So when we're creating this code space, I'll do it for the for the case we've already tried. So in this case, our stabilizers are Z1, Z2, and Z2, and Z3, right? So we're checking, um, we're checking in pairs. So we need that every pair of these, if we apply Z operators to both of these, then we get minus 1 squared. OK? Um, and if we apply uh, Z operators to the first two, we'll get uh, either zero, uh, minus 1 to the 0 or minus 1 to the 2. OK, so we're going to start with every possible state in this um, eight-dimensional space, and then we'll rule out the ones that have negative eigenvalues. So first, we apply Z1 and Z2, and we find that we get rid of this middle block because they all have negative eigenvalues. Um, and then we're just left with four. So we've halved the safe state space. So every time we apply a stabilizer, we get rid of half. And then we'll apply the two and three and we find we get rid of another half, so we're left with just the two states that we had before. So this is a stabilizer space, a very simple one that's stabilized by these two. Um, the last thing to note is that we only needed these two. We could have considered Z1, Z3 as well, um, but notice that Z1, Z3 is just the product of our two stabilizers, so it's generated by states that are in the group. So we don't need it. It could be there, but it makes no difference. Now, things get a lot more complicated now. So we had an easy case where we just had eight qubits, but we saw we could only correct for single flip errors, which is not very useful. Um, so what we want to do is, can we correct for a lot more errors? So for all sorts of errors that could occur. And to do that, we do something called a toric code. And it looks horrendous, but the principle is exactly the same. So what we do is we say, um, we've got our stabilizers at SV and SP, okay? 
Now, SV is saying, oh, let's step back a bit. This graph, the lines represent qubits. So all the edges are a qubit. So we've got a qubit for every single edge here. And the vertices and the faces represent our stabilizers. So if I consider this face, it's this, what we call a plaquette stabilizer, acting on all the qubits that surround it. So it's a Z operation on every qubit. And this is one of the stabilizers. There's another stabilizer that's the vertex uh, stabilizer. And that means that's X on every qubit surrounding. Now, what we do is we consider our stabilizer set to be every possible vertex and plaquette operation. So for every face, we have a different four Zs that we apply. And that's a stabilizer. And we want to produce a space uh, so that it's stabilized. Um, we want to produce the code space that's stabilized by this full set of SVs and SPs. Um, now, what we want to be left with is about two states so that we can have a, uh, a single qubit. So this whole thing will encode one qubit. But in fact, this one will encode two because um, there will be uh, two less stabilizers than um, two less stabilizers than there are qubits. And the reason for that is because uh, the final paquette, um, the final paquette can be generated by all the other paquettes put together. So if we find the product of applying paquettes everywhere, it will give us this last one. Um, and the product of the vertices everywhere will give us the last one. And the reason that happens is because we've got a torus. So we're associating this side with that side and the base with the top. So it's a, it's a ring like that picture there. So we've got, a, um, we've got some symmetry there on the boundaries. And there are other codes that don't have the symmetry, but this one's probably the easiest one to explain. So what happens is we end up encoding two qubits here. So we've got four states that this one will encode. Um, and these stabilizers satisfy the property that they commute because every one of these plaquettes and faces will cross over in two places. And we have the X and Z anti-commute. So if we have X, uh, Z, and X, Z, that will be equal to Z, X, and Z, X. We just get minus one squared. Okay, but let's consider a simple, yes. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, so part of what you say is definitely true. Yes, this is a very complicated code and that's the reason we don't have it yet. Uh, it's using huge numbers of qubits. Um, and so it's gonna be very expensive to implement. Um, the, if, if we, if we were just to naively implement it, then it would be hopeless. We'd just be multiplying errors. But the thing is that we keep doing these checks. And if and there's something called the threshold theorem, which we'll get to in a bit. And what it is, is if you, basically, if you analyze this and work out what happens every time you make the plaquette measurements, you get some errors. Um, and every time you do a logical operation, you get some errors, but, um, it's hard to get a logical error on this, right? Because to get a logical error, and I haven't gone through this, but basically a logical error involves having a Z on every one of these qubits in a line. Okay, so a logical error is hard. So we can get loads of errors here, and it doesn't matter because we'll correct them. It's only a problem if we get a logical error, and a logical error is hard to get. And there's a trade-off between the probability of error in a single gate and the length of the code that tells you what the threshold is. So for a, if your errors are too probable, they happen too often, it's hopeless. You can't build this code because like you said, it just makes things work. But if the errors are low enough, then it's possible to make this code. And then the probability of a logical error is so much smaller than the probability of a single error that actually by making the code bigger, you make it better and better. And therefore the bigger the code, the more resilient you are to errors, but it's a threshold. So it's a very good question. And we'll hopefully address some of it again if it wasn't entirely clear. Okay, so 
this is just a proof that we get uh, two qubits out of this. So filling them in with blue means measuring a plaquette. So if we don't measure any plaquettes, that's the same as measuring all the plaquettes. And we'll see very briefly why that's the case. So if we measure this plaquette, we get a Z on each of the corners. But this is a very small toric code. So this is so that I can fit it on the screen. So this is only uh, how many qubits? Eight qubits, this one, because we're associating top and bottom. So this Z appears here and this Z appears there. OK, but that's the same as measuring these three plaquettes here. We get this one. Uh, if we measure two, we see we've got two Zs here and here. OK, that's Z squared. So we've done Z twice, which is the identity. So on this one, I've just resolved identities and got rid of them. So we can see measuring two like that is the same as measuring two on the other side. And if we do three, we've got a load more of these identities. And if we simplify them all, we see we've just got the final plaquette. So that's the reason that we only need three to generate the whole space. So we've got an extra degree of freedom. And we have the same for the vertices, which gives us two extra degrees of freedom. Uh, so we only need six stabilizers, three vertices, three plaquettes, which means we've got two logical qubits uh, for this torus. And it's the same for any size of torus. We still get uh, two logical qubits. OK, and then if we did them all, then we can see everything becomes the identity. So we're back to the original one. The logical qubit, the logical uh, operators are given by this. So if we want to flip uh, this toric code qubit, um, for the first qubit, we have to act x's going vertically across these lines. And if we want to do a phase gate, then we have to go across the middle. So we can see that these two anti-commute because they cross in one place. So therefore, uh, we've got that the logical x and the logical z will anti-commute as they should if they're acting on the same qubit. And if they're acting on different qubits, we can see that they won't cross. So this x acts across here. So there's no way we can get that to cross with this z because they'll always act on different qubits. Um, so they will commute operators on uh, different of our logical qubits, but the ones on the same won't, because we have the ZL XL equals minus XL Z, as we need. So these are operators, and the nice thing is they go all the way around our torus. So it's a really long path. Um, OK, now. Uh, a little extra thing to note is that these paths can be deformed, so we don't have to have a path all the way across. Because these logical operators commute with our stabilizers, um, then we find if we put a stabilizer there, it cancels out that one and adds these. So this is also a logical Z. And over here, we put a vertex here, and we find that it makes this path look a bit different. But it's still a logical X, um, because it commutes with the plaquettes. So it doesn't matter how many plaquettes we put on, we can have these weird paths, but they'll still be logical ones, as long as they go all the way from top to bottom. And that's what this thing is showing. These are also logical gates, but they've got weird paths because of acting plaquette operators on them. And what we can think of this as is we can imagine each of these Zs is an error. So we say, you've got this toric code, and then some of the qubits pick up errors. So the only way we can get a logical error is if we make a path all the way across. It can be jagged, so it's more probable than getting a straight line path, and it can happen anywhere, so it can happen up there or down there. But it, we have to have enough to populate every way all the way along. So it's quite, it's much less probable than just a single error occurring, which is, hopefully, does that answer your, eventually get around to it. Um, and then the other thing is just, well, how do we measure these plaquettes? And we've got to measure them again in a way that doesn't involve measuring our qubits. So we just do the same as before. We do C knots on each of the qubits, so four qubits. And then we only do the measurement once we've done them all. So we only know uh, if the expectation is one or if it's minus one of the whole thing. 
Um, and it's the same for the uh, the X ones. We just are C not gate. I'll draw it again. Hopefully, my one will be more readable. So we have this, and then on the other board, there's something called a Hadamard, which we've had before. Um, but just as a reminder, if we act the Hadamard on this C not. That's the wrong notation, X. So if we act the Hadamard on the first qubit of the C0, then it's going to change the zero to a plus, where plus is the eigenstate of um, X, the X operator. So acting two Hadamards either side gives us the measurement operator we want for the X. And then we only flip it if we measure an X on the first qubit or the second or the third. And we'll get the syndrome measurement corresponding to that vertex. So we have to do all the syndrome measurements, and then we get this list. And that's what the next one shows. So this is the process. So we get some errors. And where the errors happen next to each other, then we get sort of a chain of errors. And we only detect either end because um, we're looking at the Xs. And if we have two x's on a plaquette, then that error will commute with that plaquette. So the middle ones of the path have an x on either side. And so we've got z's and x's here, z's and x's here, and they cancel out. But if we have an odd number at the end of the path, we detect it. So our results are that we've got all these paths of errors, but we don't know what the paths are. We just know these stars. So we just know the plaquettes and vertices at the ends of the chains. And then we do some classical computing to try and work out what the most likely paths are. Once we've got those, we make an estimate. This is the MWPM. The, so we basically say, what's the shortest distance we need to connect all these errors up? And then we make a correction based on that. And our correction doesn't have to be exactly the same as the path that they took originally. If you notice, there's one in the middle there that the correction's different. As long as they're the same up to a plaquette, then the correction will be successful because um, plaquettes commute with everything, uh, with all the logical operators. So we don't care about having an error up to a plaquette. OK. I don't know if, yeah. Um, the physical reason would be mainly just because it's easier to think of phone qubits next to each other in if we were building uh, some hardware. So having there's other codes where they have higher dimensions, where you need you where you couldn't represent it in a two D array. But the reason we use a two D array is uh, partly because it's easier to study, but also because it's probably closer to what we'd be able to do on hardware. Um, okay, right, and the if we use this protocol, the minimum weight perfect matching for this toric code, then you can work out the threshold that we talked about earlier. And the threshold is about 1%. So if you had errors less than 1% for every operation, um, then you could stabilize the computation. Then your errors would be sufficiently low that increasing the size of the code would be better. But it makes some assumptions about how good you are at interpreting things. Um, so the actual threshold might be a little bit lower. Um, and this is just a general um, note on thresholds. So the idea of a threshold theorem is that you have some probability of error that's going along the bottom, so increasing error along the bottom, and then up the uh, left-hand side, that's the probability of error on your logical qubit. So once you've built this hugely complicated code, what's your new probability of error? And if the single qubit error is too high, as you said, uh, then the probabilities get bigger. So each of these lines represents a bigger code. So you can see on this side, they're reducing the errors. But on that side, if we've got too many errors, as you said, it just explodes. Like making it bigger is not going to help us in any way. But if the errors are low enough, then when we make the code bigger, the code distance increases. It takes more errors to make a logical error. And therefore, the bigger the code, the more efficient we are, uh, the more likely we are to perform a 
successful um, iteration of some algorithm. And still, the lower gate error we can get, the better, because we get we need fewer qubits to get the same improvement if we go to the left. Okay, so so this is the idea, um, and it's it's uh, it would be a very complicated code, which is why it's not a near-term application, but it should be something that we could get a certain size of code that we'd be able to run any algorithm we want on, because the errors would be sufficiently suppressed. So that's sort of the dream, um, but we're quite a long way away from it at the moment. And there's, um, so there's one other thing we, well, one other thing that we have to think about, and that's how we implement it. So we're going to have to do gates not only on qubits, as we saw before, but between qubits. Um, and what we don't want to do is that a gate from one qubit to another involves um, interacting every qubit with every other qubit, because that's a huge number of interactions that will grow as the size of our uh, code grows, and that will be a massive problem because the threshold results wouldn't hold. So what we need to do is be able to do it transversely. So roughly speaking, we should be able to do any operation we want to do, we should be able to do it on one qubit of the first logical qubit and one of the second, or a small number of the second. So that if there's an error in this one, it can only propagate to this one, and it's not going to spread to the whole logical qubit. Because if it did that, we'd suddenly get a whole string of errors and we'd get a logical error straight away. Uh, so this is another challenge of these codes, is that we've got to make every gate that we need transversal. Um, there's a set called Clifford gates, which they're basically just gates that satisfy this. So if we have a Pauli word, a Clifford gate will just map a Pauli word to a Pauli word. So, um, so they're particularly simple gates, and if we only have Clifford gates, we can actually classically simulate everything. So they're not enough to do useful quantum computation. So we need some other gates, and unfortunately, the other gates that we need can't easily be implemented in a transversal way. So we need an additional trick. And this trick um, is, um, is what we do. So the Clifford, Clifford set is almost enough for universal computation, as we saw before. We need one extra gate. So we need a T-gate. And the T-gate we can't implement in the way that we want to. So what we have to do is we have to make a, a composite structure that behaves like a T-gate. So if we make a T-state, and a T-state is just a T-gate acting on a plus state, uh, so the plus state that's over there, then we act to C not from this is our original state, then we act to C not, then we measure the T state, uh, and then we act this other matrix, an S matrix, which is just a phase. So S is just this. Um, then we act an S if we measure a one, and we do nothing if we measure a zero. Then that's the same as acting the T gate on the original state. The nice thing about that is we know we can do C knots uh, transversely. So that means the only gates we're having to apply, and we can do S transversal because it's a Clifford gate. So the only gates we have to apply are transversal gates. But it does mean we have to make this T state. Um, and that is, that can be done. We've got to make a logical T state, so it's a big thing. And it can be done, but it needs a huge number of qubits. So I'm not going to go in the full details of this, but basically your qubits are um, moving forward in time as you go along this picture, and the size of those, of the faces of those, is how many qubits you have. So you do all these operations moving forward in time, and then this particular machine, I think, gives you two logical t's. So it's heavy. It takes about ten to the five qubits to make two t qubits. So this is another massive overhead with this. There's different ways to make it, but it's a huge overhead. The only reason this doesn't completely destroy everything, because if we had to run one of these factories for every T, then we're scaling exponentially in T and we've got the same problem. The only redeeming feature is that we could run this T gate multiple times as long as we've got long enough coherence 
times. So we would run it to get two T's and then we'd immediately run it again to get uh, to get some more T's using the same qubits as soon as we've used them. So these are, one of the points of this talk is to show that there are huge technological hurdles to overcome. Like this is, this is not a near term thing, which is why it's definitely worth investigating NIST. But there are ideas how to solve the problems, but there's a long way to come uh, to be able to get them. So. The number of qubits in a T gate is very relevant for working out how this problem scales with, uh, well, how the time taken to run the problem scales with the size of the problem and things like that when we're looking at exponential or polynomial scaling. Um, okay, well, that's taken quite a while. So, how long do I have left? Half an hour. Okay, well, we'll do our best. Right, so now we're back to quantum phase estimation. So, all that stuff that we've heard before is relevant and i've i've tried to give an explanation and uh, there's other uh, references at the end if you want to go back over it um, but you can put that to the side for now and just you could imagine all the rest as if it was done on a NIST device or on an error corrected device because all we care about is the fact we've got some logical qubits it doesn't matter what they are for this next section and in the final section we'll bring them all back to the end again so right uh, quantum phase estimation. So the only bit of quantum phase uh, estimation we haven't already explored is the uh, Fourier transform part. So the Fourier transform, uh, the discrete Fourier transform is effectively applying this matrix here um, to some number. So, well, to some vector x that represents a number. So we think of um, the omega here as a root of unity. So we're saying we've got these phase factors and we want the phase to depend on the index of x and the index of y. And um, we're, we're trying to um, make the Fourier representation of a given x. And the reason this is useful is because we need it for the quantum phase estimation algorithm. But we, it's also a useful algorithm to run for many different applications. So the question is, can we do better in a quantum algorithm than we can do in a classical algorithm, assuming that we can run it? Now, to be fair, we have to compare to the best classical algorithms. So in the worst case scaling, um, it would take two to the two n steps, um, where n is the the number of these x's. Um, but we can do much better classically by using some tricks. So there's a symmetry to the problem that we can split the odd and even parts and then effectively do two discrete Fourier transforms on the odd and even parts separately, and then a little bit of extra uh, processing and if we do that and we do it iteratively so every time we split them uh, we split the DFTs in two many many times then we can reduce the scaling to n times two to the n so that's a, it's a significant increase but it's still exponential in n so it's still a hard problem to solve but it's a problem that is worth solving so it's needed a lot, so even though it's exponentially scaling, we have to solve it. So if we can find a faster algorithm, even if it was only polynomially faster, it would be worth doing. Now, in the quantum case, we have what we call a quantum Fourier transform, which is very similar to the discrete Fourier transform, but there's states involved. So each yk is associated with a state k. So if we wanted to apply the... Um, if we wanted to use a quantum Fourier transform to get a discrete Fourier transform, it wouldn't be overly useful because all we get is this state and then we have to make measurements on this and each measurement will only give us a single value of k. Okay, so we'd have to measure this 2 to the n minus 1 times minimum, but likely a lot more in order to get these coefficients. So if we wanted to use a quantum Fourier transform to perform a discrete Fourier transform is probably not going to be a good idea. But fortunately, we can use it as part of other algorithms where we don't ever need to access the Fourier transform. It's just a step to something else, like quantum phase estimation. 
So in this case, the we're thinking about our numbers we encode as vectors now. So these are a binomial uh, representation of our number. So um, with this ordering, this would be uh, one. Um, uh, there should be some more dots here because that should probably be one of the other side. So this would be like x0 times 1 plus um, x1 times uh, 2 plus x2 times 2 to the 2 and so on up to x2 to the n minus 1 times 2 to the n minus 1. No, times 2 to the, yeah, 2 to the n minus 1. So this is a representation of a number, but it's using this binary representation that we've used before. And to do the Fourier transform of this number, we, we will end up with this number where we've got these phase factors multiplying each of uh, the xj coefficients. So we'll simplify matters by first of all considering just a uh, single qubit case. Okay, so this is very easy. We've just got a number that's uh, up to three. So we can represent 0, 1, uh, 2, and 3 um, with this, with a single qubit. No, 0, 1, sorry, with a single qubit. In this case, our root of unity that we need for our uh, matrix here is just minus one. And that means that this, this matrix that's equivalent to our, uh, our discrete Fourier transform is just this Hadamard matrix that we've seen before. So it's a very simple matrix. And that means the discrete Fourier transform for a single qubit is just applying a Hadamard. So it's very simple. So that's nice. Okay. So we know how to do at least one Fourier transform in a very simple case. And the question is, can we use that information to build up the full Fourier transform of something much bigger? Now, because quantum mechanics is linear, so every unitary acting on a sum of states is just the unitary acting on the states individually, that means that uh, we can just think of one of these binary vectors. So we're just taking one binary vector and we're going to run the calculation on that. And if it works for that, then any superposition of them, it will work in exactly the same way. OK, so this is our binary vector. So that just represents a single number. So some number between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. Now. If we do the Fourier transform, we get this object. So this uh, this root of unitary times uh, to the power of the product of our number and uh, the state that it's attached to. Okay, and these are all the terms of our discrete Fourier transform, um, which we can rewrite in terms of this roots of unitary roots of unity notation that's given down here. And this k again is just a binary number. Okay, so it's a state that represents some binary number. Now, this is where things get a bit complicated. Uh, but the procedure is exactly the same for, as for the fast, well, the idea is exactly the same as for the fast Fourier transform. We're trying to exploit symmetries to make our problem easier to implement. So what we do is we have this whole long binary string and we say, okay, but I'm just gonna take off the first term in the binary. So this is, so if we have a state that was like 0, 0, 0, we're just writing it as 0 and then 0, 0. So all we've done there, that's just notation. We just pulled out the first one and said, we're going to think of it separately. So we pull out the first one here, and we say, OK, well, each of them can only have two values. It's either 0 or it's 1, right? So that's pretty simple. So why don't we just do it explicitly for the two cases? So. We take the zero case and the one case separately. We just split out our sum because we know they're both going to appear in here in this sum. Now the zero case, we then say, okay, we'll have k prime, which is just taking away our uh, taking away this k zero. So we've got a new number where we've taken away the smallest digit. So this is our original k and our new k. We've just got rid of the k zero term. So it's exactly the same. We're just taking away either 1 if k0 is 1 or 0 if k0 is 0. 
and then we need to divide by two so that we have a representation of a number again so that these uh, so that these are now a binary number again but it's it's half the number we could represent before because we've got fewer cubes now if k0 is even then um, then k k is equal to 2k prime plus k0 which is just 2k prime okay so we get that if it's odd then we need a plus one because k0 is one so we've got 2k0 plus one so these two are almost identical the only difference is a factor of omega n to the j so we can rewrite these by associating the omega n to the j with the one and then we factor this out so we get the zero plus omega n to the j times one and then we're left with the same thing so all the rest is a product so now we've got a tensor state um, a product state of just our first qubit and then everything else okay uh, so this is a bit reminiscent of um, of the fast Fourier transform in that we've now um, got two different things and what we're left with is now just another quantum Fourier transform but on fewer qubits okay so we've taken a quantum Fourier transform on n qubits to some something in a tensor product with a quantum Fourier transform on n minus one qubits and now the question is can we implement this efficiently um, and we'll answer that on the next slide so are there questions about getting through this step it took me a while to get my head around so i don't know if there's or we can move on and then go back over it uh, another time potentially okay so we then iterate this procedure and we get just a tensor product of all these terms so every time we're doing a quantum Fourier transform with one less qubit which means the root of unity is a lower order root so this is a bigger number effectively omega n minus one is omega n squared and so on so once we get to omega zero this is uh omega n to the power of uh i think it's two to the n minus one so uh this number is a root of unity but it's just minus one again it's just minus one um this omega zero um which means that if we're doing omega zero to the j most of the time we just get well half the time we get one half the time we get minus one okay so most of the time we don't have to do any calculation because multiplying by one is nothing it, it, it's very easy to to do so um so we're back this is the summary so we can make it into this product of all these different um applications where it looks like we're just applying some phase to the different qubits so we can think of this as just applying a phase gate to each of the qubits but it's controlled it's a controlled phase because it's got this j so we need to somehow encode the j which was the original number um into this controlled phase gate um now j is an integer so we can write it in this form um, of just the sum over the number of bits in the binary representation um, and we can think of it as i said as a controlled rotation so we say uh, you you rotate so in this case where we've just got omega is minus one you do the odd j you multiply by minus one for even day j you multiply by one and then for all the other ones we'll have different phases so as a circuit this is just a load of controlled phase gates so the thing to notice is that this bottom line is the single qubit case so it's just running a hadamard that's the one we did right at the beginning the next one we have the hadamard and then we have this when um when omega is uh this will be um the fourth root of unity so here so we have to apply one phase gate um, and then the Hadamard one that we do for everything. And as you build this up, you go higher and higher, you have to do more and more. So we have to put our, we have to invert our representation of 
our original J. So we go J0, J1, Jn minus one, and so on. Um, because of the uh, the way the the sum adds up. So this last one is like omega n omega n to the two n minus one um, to the power of j, and j is sum of l j to the l two to the l. So uh, the only so as soon as as soon as L is one or greater, we just have omega n two to the n plus uh, some number, and omega n to the two to the n is just one. So we've got one to the power of something, so we don't have to do anything. And that's why at this final line, we've just got the Hadamard, and why we have fewer um, in each line above that. Um, so now, OK, that's the algorithm. And it'll probably take some going over to to get exactly how everything's working. But the aim is that we have um, the aim is the the idea is that we can run this with a relatively small number of gates. So we need n times n minus one over two gates. We need n gates for this one, n minus one, and so on and so on, and one gate at the end. So this is a this is a polynomial number of gates, right? And for the fast Fourier uh, transform, we need n to times two to the n steps. So this looks like an exponential speed up. So it's looking pretty promising for this particular algorithm. And then the question is, what can we use it for? And we've already had this answer before. We can use it for quantum phase estimation. And in quantum phase estimation, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we, you have some unitary and you want to estimate the phase that this unitary uh, provides on, uh, say, the, the ground state. So when you act it on, on some state, you want to know what the phase is. Uh, so you, you apply u to the state, and then you need to know what the phase it generates is. Um, now, we can represent the phase um, as a binary fraction. So this is just a binary, but going down to 2 to the minus 1 and so on. So if we multiply this uh, binary fraction by 2 to the power of t, then we'll get an integer and some extra terms. So if we want to know this to a precision 2 to the t, uh, 2 to the minus t, it's sufficient to just calculate what this integer 2 to the t times by is. The reason that's important is because we're going to use quantum Fourier transforms, which need an integer value um, for our fate. Uh, and this is the this is the diagram that we saw in the previous lectures. So the um, the quantum phase estimation, we have some u that goes in. Uh, we add some u to the j uh, on this u, which induces a phase. Um, and then we we have this uh, these Anstiller qubits that we prepare using the Hadamard um, into this superposition of every number from uh, zero to two to the uh, n, where n is the number in that register. And then we do an inverse Fourier transform, and we want this inverse Fourier transform to tell us the phase that was generated by this u to the j. So this is an expansion of the Fourier transform. Uh, so this is an expansion of uh, the u to the j. So because j is an integer, um, we can expand it in the binary basis again. So we do the 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, and 2 to the t minus 1. And we associate those with each of these with a different um, a different qubit within our registry. Uh, so we then we get this phase kickback that we saw before. So by acting a controlled U um, with uh, this state after the Hadamard, then we get phase kickback from that as if we've acted the phase on the one part of the state. Um, and I don't have time to go through phase kickback, but it's explained well in um, one of the previous lectures. So 
we start off with our initial state where we've got all the ancillas and our initial state that's, um, that we want to find the phase on. Then we create a superposition of these zero states. Um, we then apply our U, whatever that is, and then we get uh, we get this result, which looks very much like a quantum Fourier transform that we saw before with all these product terms. And then we invert the quantum Fourier transform and we measure this first register. And that will give us two to the T times the phase that we're looking for. Uh, and that should give us the answer. And the last thing, okay, I think we're almost out of time. So we'll, we'll go through this quickly. So the quick question, if we're not in the state U, but we have some superposition, then we covered this before, but can anyone remember what will happen if we're not in the state U? What's the probability of getting the right answer? Yes, the first coefficient squared. So if we didn't perfectly prepare the U that we wanted, then we've got some probability of getting the right answer and some probability of failing. Um, if we can't represent this perfectly using only two t, uh, t qubits, so that's if we multiply it by two to the t and it's not an integer, which will generally be the case, then um, we're going to get some bias. So we won't get quite the right answer. But we can mitigate this by just using more qubits. So we use a, um, a higher resolution. And if we do that, it can be shown that um, for a failure probability of delta, that we need um, log one over delta extra qubits. So it's not too much of an overhead to reduce our probability of error exponentially. But then we've also got this other source of error, this uh, the fact we may not prepare our state perfectly. So looking at it from a, a resource viewpoint, um, we need log one over epsilon qubits where epsilon is the error we tolerate. So that's the the number of um, the value of t, basically. So what the resolution is of our method. Then we need uh, order one over epsilon controlled u gates. This is assuming that when you do u to the n, you have to actually apply u n times. So we've just got a black box u. Um, and then we need log one over epsilon squared gates in the inverse quantum Fourier transform, which is just this uh, t squared, which is the number of qubits in the register. We need the square of that to apply the quantum Fourier transform. So this means that overall, the order is about 1 over the error, 1 over the accuracy. Um, and all that is to say, basically, that this is, uh, this is the square root of what we would get from, say, a variation on ANZATS where we'd have to statistically sample and to get an accuracy one over epsilon, we'd need one over epsilon squared shots. So we need to run it uh, a square of the number of times that we need to run this one effectively. Uh, so it's cheaper by a polynomial amount than the variational algorithms, which maybe is not so exciting as exponential, but as some people know, going from say a month to a week or uh, um, or a week to a day or something is still is still pretty useful. Okay, so this uh, and then there's an explanation about uh, complexity. So quantum phase estimation is BQP complete. So that's as hard as the hardest polynomial time algorithm. So we're not. This is the hardest sort of problem that we that it's sensible to try and solve on a quantum computer, basically. Um, OK, but we need a huge number of gates. And therefore, it's unlikely that this could be implemented easily on this devices. And therefore, this is probably going to be something that we're going to have to wait until we've got uh, error correction. Um, OK, and then let's see. So we did. So I think we're basically out of time. So let's see what we can do. So we said before that if you can't match perfectly, then you get some error based on your overlap with the ground state. So if we're using this for ground state estimation, 
So this is one error that we considered that wasn't considered in the scaling of uh, the complexity. But if if we've got um, if we've got a problem we want to solve, this is an additional cost. Um, the other thing to consider that we looked at a bit before is how long we have to run it for. So we've got to run each of these gates. Um, and we've got two to the t gates. So the evolution time is going to scale at about two to the t um, to get an accuracy of one over t. Um, and as we saw before, that's a, a square of the accuracy we would get with the variational approach. So that's a benefit. Um, I'm not going to go through this again because we don't have time. It's the jordan Bigner transform, so we can move from uh, fermionic Hamiltonian to a qubit Hamiltonian. And here we've got the map here. Uh, the other thing we have to do, which was also well described earlier, is we've got to trotterize our unitary. So we have some unitary we want to apply. Uh, we can't apply that, so we have to break it into Pauli words. Um, and then that's going to incur an extra error as well, depending on the size of R. So if we add up all these contributions, we've got the, the cost of producing the Hamiltonian. So we've got, um, say, if we're using m qubit, so if we have m to n uh, creation and annihilation operators, then we need m to the four in order to uh, m to the four terms in order to reproduce this term. Um, we then each of our Pauli operators is uh, of length m because we've got all these uh, we've got all these z's as well as the final operator on the end. So they're roughly speaking the same length as the number of creation operators we had to start. So that gets us up to order m to the four, where m is the size of our original state space. Then we've also got the fact we do the trotter approximation. So that gives us another factor of r, where r is the number of times we have to repeat this simplified matrix, which is one that we can apply. That's all the m to the, uh, that we'll have all the m to the, uh, that, well, this one to apply will be roughly order m. So it's just an exponential of a Pauli word. Uh, then we've got to apply it r times because the trotter uh, decomposition only works if this p over r is very very small, um, and it's it's generally difficult to work out what sort of r you need, but it can go into our order calculation. So we're at m to the five times r, uh, where m is our state space size and r is our trotter, um, the number of trotter terms we need. So if we put things together, we've got um, that the total cost is going to be, um, so we've got these poly bit, poly m and poly one over epsilon, and that's the cost of, uh, the cost due to our state space of applying these U operators. We've also got the cost of preparing the initial state C, which we put as a constant, but uh, we'll go clear on that. And then we've got this one over s cost, where s is the uh, overlap of our original state with the state we're actually trying to find the phase of. So there's a whole load of things that are going to be expensive in here. They're all poly by the looks of things, which is nice, um, but there's a lot of them. And the problem is, we made some assumptions here. So they're all poly in the variables that are in there, but s um, is the overlap. And it depends how well we can make this initial state. And in the worst case, if we imagine um, if we imagine we have a product state and the true result is a product state, then we can work out the overlap between each term in that product and say that was s. Then we get s to the power of the number of terms in the product. So we can see s could be exponential. So we've got to have a really good state preparation, because if our state preparation is bad, scales badly with uh, system size, then it's going to mess up everything and we're back to exponential scaling. Um, and this is a big problem because uh, with variational ansatzes, you can often get something that has a very good estimate for energy, but the overlap is exponentially small.
So we'd have to be careful, even if we used a variational algorithm to prepare our state and then run this to improve it, we might still not have something that works. So this is something to consider. Uh, the other way that we've also talked about before, the adiabatic state preparation. So if we try and evolve from one state where we're we have one Hamiltonian, we're in the ground state, and we try and do things really slowly so we stay in the ground state and get to the state we want. This particular problem, we need to run it for a time that's inverse to the smallest energy difference between the ground and the first excited state. Um, so as long as that scales polynomially, this approach will work. Um, but it's generally unknown for a given problem. And if it doesn't scale polynomially, again, uh, we've got an issue. Um, and then there will be additional noise sources due to thermal excitations. So this procedure is also going to have problems if um, if there's some heat involved. Um, and we don't need much heat. It's only got to be bigger than this separation between the lowest levels, and it will give us a kick. Um, so there's there's lots of things that can make this a lot more complicated than it looks on the surface. Um, and the last thing is just saying that we'll only, so in the previous lecture, we talked a bit about the, um, well, we heard a bit about uh, the idea of hardware efficient gate sets. So for any application, you've got to choose a gate set that you can actually implement. And ideally you want to be hardware efficient, um, but that means to, it might be that within your your gate set is quite hard to make the unitary that you actually want to make, and you might need uh, quite a few gates to do that. So that's also something that has to go in, like how many gates does it take to produce this trotterized unitary that you know you can make, but maybe with the limited gate set you have access to, it's hard. Um, and this is called the synthesis error. And the idea is that overall, all these errors together, we want to get it less than the chemical accuracy so that it's giving us results that are comparable to what we have in experiments. And we can predict reactions for things that we're actually interested in. So the nice thing is that we can get estimates for, for these errors. And um, if you can define what your errors are for QP, uh, for the quantum phase estimate, estimation algorithm, and if you can work out your trotter error um, and you know your target error, then you can work out what sort of gate sets you're going to have to use to make it work. So you've got the information there, um, but it's but it's but uh, there's a lot of things to think about when you're running a quantum computer, which is maybe not surprising, but it's um, useful to think about. And the last thing we'll do um, is we'll just so here's some sort of back of the envelope calculations for a particular application. So um, if we wanted to uh, compute the ground state of this molecule with 54 state orbitals, so we need 54 qubits, uh, then uh, we need 54 qubits to represent it. And then we also need the, uh, the qubits to um, to be in our ancilla to make the Fourier transform. So we need about 110 qubits. Um, we need about 1,000 or maybe 10,000 physical qubits for a logical qubit, so it's a lot, huge number. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got the number of T gates that we have, uh, and we've got the number of factories, the number of qubits we need for each T factory to make these T factory, to make these T gates or T state. Um, so our total number of qubits is about 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8. And if we do a rough calculation, we'd expect it's going to take between days and months to run this quantum computer. And I think coherence time, so the length of time you can run a quantum computer before, uh, before noise destroys everything at the moment. I saw something that said an hour, and I think that's pretty optimistic. Uh, like most things would probably be way shorter than that, like of the order of minutes or something. So all this is to say we need to do a lot of work in making gates better. We're doing well about getting to large number of qubits, like uh, IBM has a nice, um, nice plan for scaling it up. 
But if we don't get these fidelities to be much higher um, and work out, we're never going to be able to implement these sorts of big algorithms. So um, I think the conclusion is let's try and make some higher quality qubits, higher quality gates, and that will also help with the NISC approach, and it will be vital for, for moving forward to these more powerful algorithms. Um, oh, there is one more slide. Let's see. Ah, so this is just saying um, with gate fidelity, if gate fidelity is low, as we saw before, we can simulate things. If it's low enough, we can actually simulate it um, without much extra cost, even if the number of qubits increases massively. Um, so it can be done efficiently. Um, if the error is low, but we have few qubits, then it can still be simulated. So the point we want to get to is where we get a quantum advantage. So um, we want to be in a position where the fidelity is much, much better so that scaling to a larger number of qubits makes sense. Because if we're in this regime and we scale up, it's no good. But if we're up here, uh, then it's something potentially useful. Okay, and some references. So uh, quantum uh, computation and quantum information is a really good book for just going over uh, all the, the basics and a lot of the more detailed stuff. Um, there's a nice explanation of quantum phase estimation in this quantum computation and chemistry one as well. It'll go through in a lot more detail than I was able to today. Um, and this is quite an interesting paper. It's looking at if there is actually an exponential advantage for a quantum computer, if we've got evidence of that yet, or whether um, whether that's something we still need to look for. Because there's still a question whether the chemistry applications will be exponentially better or polynomially better once we consider everything. Um, and there's a video that goes along with that that's quite it's worth looking at, um, and some other uh, information on that. I think that's everything. So sorry that I have overrun. But thank you all for listening. <laughs>